had to answer tough questions as to what uh, decolonization means for our teaching uh, and for the curriculum. Mm -hmm. That process uh, made us think hard about these questions and resulted in some reforms in, in the curriculum. But of course, students uh, who see our curriculum now think that we haven't done enough. So it, 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 it's a continuous process. We have always to think about these questions um, um, as part of a collective response because these questions are being posed in all universities in South Africa. The uh, South African Law Deans Association decided to host a conference of students uh, to debate the question of decolonization of the law. And this was held uh, this year in June uh, at the University of Asia. Um, and so students um, uh, sub uh, submitted papers and read papers at this conference and raised many important um, issues. And the result of that has been that uh, at this faculty, we have, uh, we're in the process of constituting a student group, uh, working group, that will um, coordinate the um, submissions for students on our curriculum review. It's a student-led process, uh, which will be shared by student leaders, and they will look at our curriculum and uh, collect submissions and views to staff so that we can engage with their submissions. A student-led process, we want to see um, what kind of ideas uh, students have. Uh, which brings me to this event today, um, um, which I'm very happy about, that my colleagues uh, in commercial law, especially uh, the Intellectual Property Unit, uh, and the Society Chair for uh, Intellectual Property Innovation and Development, have, uh, um, together with Rick Yates, South Africa, uh, come together to uh, host this event, um, inviting people from far uh, away from the United States to speak with us, to share their thoughts on this um, um, interesting question. Um, uh, at some point, uh, when I met Sean Flynn, I know him, so he's not a stranger to me, uh, we co-authored a paper some uh, 16 years ago uh, to a, 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 um, a book. Um, at that time, uh, I was uh, aware of this in the context of the WTO, the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, questions that are being posed about decolonization were posed in different ways in this forum. And what is interesting is that at the international level, um, or at least in, in, in the West, those questions are being posed in different ways, uh, sometimes politically through the right-wing rhetoric. But those are the same questions that we were raising then about the fairness of um, uh, systems of trade, systems of um, intellectual property, and all that. And so this topic today is quite interesting to me, um, um, including the question whether it is even intelligible to talk about copyright law and decolonization. Um, um, and so I'm very curious about uh, what Professor uh, Ariki G is going to talk about, and Professor Sean Flynn, especially uh, given the um, wide international experience that both of them have. Um, I'll give a brief introduction about our two speakers. Uh, the first is Professor Sean Flynn, whom I've said I met maybe 17 years ago. Um, he is no stranger to South Africa because he served at the Constitutional Court as a clerk. Um, uh, I can't remember which judge, it's, uh, I think uh, Chief Justice Jaskerson, he was in clerk for, um, um, at the South African Constitutional Court. And also, he also served as a clerk to Judge Raymond Fisher of the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Ninth uh, Circuit. He is now professor at uh, American uh, University is working in the College of Law, uh, where he's Associate Director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. So um, his interests at the time when we met him were in uh, utilities, privatization, and the right to water, which are linked to uh, the issues that he's uh, dealing with now um, in intellectual property. Welcome to South Africa again. I'm sure it's a home to you, uh, not really a stranger. The main speaker is Professor uh, Professor Ruth uh, Okediji, 
uh, from Harvard Law School, uh, who is not necessarily a friend of the faculty, but a friend of a friend uh, <laughs> of the faculty, or somebody who is the faculty uh, um, uh, under Odo, uh, uh, who is associate professor and the director of the Center for Comparative Law in Africa. He told me that you, you are a very good friend. In the of that, I am also a very good friend of yours, and welcome to uh, Cape Town. Uh, professor Okediji is a Jeremiah Smith Junior professor, uh, uh, professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Berkman Train Center. She is um, a known um, and uh, 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 intellectual in intellectual property. Uh, she has published widely and has advised intergovernmental organizations in various capacities. Um, um, among the highlights of her career include being a member of the United States Nation, National Academies Board on Science, um, Technology and Policy Committee on the Impact of Corporate Law on Innovation and <coughs> of Era. Uh, she was appointed by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, to the 2015 to 2016 high-level panel on access to medicines. Um, I've done some work on access to medicines, and uh, so through that I've known uh, some of your work uh, there. Um, and she also served as chief technical expert and lead negotiator for the delegation of Nigeria to the 19, sorry, 2013 um, Wipo Diplomatic Conference concluded treaty to facilitate access to published works by visually, visually impaired persons and persons with print disability. It's a mouthful name, but I'm sure it was some uh, important work that you did there. Um, so we're looking forward to your talks um, and to your thoughts um, uh, as we are grappling with this important topic of decolonization uh, of the law in South Africa. Thank you We are live on YouTube on the okay. Big Big Debate South Africa YouTube channel and the Recreate Twitter and Facebook channels. And please share. <laughs> Tell your friends. So this is um, such an exciting place to be talking about this topic, and uh, you know, Ruth is such an exciting person to be part of this conversation. And I just want to give us maybe a little bit of a setup as someone who's been following South African copyright law for a very long time. Um, and even before that, as Dan would mentioned, um, here working on your constitutional court, which was probably the biggest honor of my life, working for Arthur Chaskerson, who's an amazing hero. I'm sure all of you know him. Um, and, and at that point, uh, Dan Wood and I and some others were working on these kind of cutting edge issues of how the Constitution overlays with utility, water, and electricity regulation. And I just want to take a moment to say that I'm still doing that work. You know, and, and even as you're thinking of decolonizing your education, breaking down some of these artificial barriers. Like, why is it that we put IP into commercial law instead of public law? And it's interesting, if you follow the chain back through where these laws come from, the word patent does not actually mean 
monopoly and it has actually the word itself has nothing to do with inventions or, or copyrights or what we know of as patents today. The word means open, not closed. And the reason we had it was from the Coal Warranto campaign in the 13th century in England, and it was an effort to regulate the abuse of franchises, monopolies that were given by lords of a particular region. And the reason you gave them a letter patent, an open letter, was so that you could take it away. It was so that if you abused your franchise, you had a vehicle to punish to remove the franchise, to create competition in an area where there was no competition. And out of that root comes actually two strands. The franchises that we give utilities, so the legal right to be the only electricity utility is known as a franchise. It's a public right to be the only giver of a particular good and service in a geographical area. We now refer to as intellectual property patents, letter of patents for a new invention was the same legal vehicle that we gave you to be the only supplier of a mill to grain, to grind your grain or a ferry across a river. And it's important because in each of those areas, the grant of the exclusive right always carried a public duty. You would lose your franchise if you do not serve the entire community on reasonable and non-discriminatory conditions, which becomes, in the South African constitution, your social and economic rights. Right? It gives rise to the ability to bring legal strategies to make water utilities price water equitably <coughs> not charge, as we were looking at at those times, higher prices in townships than you were in the city, for instance. And those same kind of principles should be motivating what we're doing in the intellectual property sphere as well. And so hopefully you've been kind of marinating on this quote, which is it's just one place that you can bring yourself into of collapsing the divide between private and public law, between commercial law and constitutional law, between what we think of as public interest law and what we think of as business law. Because every price in every market is determined by the legal rules that we craft. So there's no such thing as a market price versus a regulated price. Every price is regulated. Every price in a market is determined by the legal rules that we, as democratic agents, are ultimately responsible to. And, you know, this country went through that most recently with the decolonization campaigns within the educational system here, but it should still be going. And we should be thinking through how our legal structure affects, for instance, access to educational materials, which is what we're here to talk about today. So there's elements of South Africa's law. Excuse me. Elements of South African law that you that South Africa's copyright law that people have been looking at through this kind of decolonization terms. And now I'm, I'm, I'm using the terms that recreate has been using to describe what they're pushing for as positive reform. And each of these has a material component. And, and basically the overall setup is that within the system of distribution of books and music and other copyrighted goods, there are today a small number of multinational monopolies that govern the distribution layer. There's essentially five big publishers that monopolize about 70% of the global publishing industry and the South African publishing industry as well. There's three big labels that monopolize 70% of music distribution and music distribution in South Africa as well. 
And if you look at different elements of South Africa's copyright law, which nominally is supposed to be protecting the interests of authors, it's actually written in ways that provide more protection to those intermediaries than it does to the actual authors themselves. And also lacks some important flexibilities, exceptions, etc., for public interest concerns. So in ownership, you know, ownership automatically defaults to the commissioning party for many works instead of the author themselves. The law allows free assignment of your copyright, which is a good thing. But when you're assigning your copyright to a monopoly, you have very little bargaining power. And so you often sell for a very low price. And then the royalties that are made on the work over time go to that intermediary instead of the author themselves. And so it lacks what we would call a reversion right, a right for that copyright to come back. In earning, you may have seen a lot of the disputes around collective management organizations who then again, they take the rights and they charge the users, and then their job is to distribute the royalties back to the authors, but they often don't do that very well. And the governance of those systems is not very well regulated in South Africa, so many of the organizations are actually dominated by the publishers and labels instead of the authors. And then finally, one of the big debates is around the right to create. Do we have enough exceptions to reuse material as creators to create new works. So the context of the South Africa copyright, which addresses all of these items in various detail, and now I'm talking on the right to create side, the exceptions that we have in copyright to reuse materials in various ways, is that there's an overall trend as countries amend their law to create more open exceptions. Exceptions that apply to more uses, more rights by different kinds of users. And part of that is because we're in this technological environment where if you have very restrictive use rights, it doesn't capture what we're really doing. So many laws around the country, South Africa is not one, that has an educational right that, that allows reprographic copies of a single excerpt of a work for classroom use. So what does that not cover? That doesn't cover putting something on the web so you can use it at home. You're no longer in the classroom. That's not a reprographic copy, and it's not a single copy. right? So you need more open exceptions, exceptions that apply to more kinds of rights, more kinds of works, more kinds of users, in order to be adaptable as technology changes and our, our use changes. So more open rights are better for enabling digi the digital environment, for in the education system, for enabling teaching and learning those uses that we And so again, what you find, and this is from a study that we did of about 40 different countries looking at a timeline from 1970 until 2014, and it captures kind of the digital revolution, is that all countries, as they amend their constitution, sorry, amend their copyright, take this lesson and make their exceptions a little more open over time. But you see there's a huge gap. The wealthier countries are moving towards more open exceptions much faster than the developing countries. So we call this a development gap. If you took it just kind of on a timeline and kind of compared where we were, you'd have to go back about 30 years in the average of developing countries in order to get to the point at which the more industrialized countries were at that time. So South Africa specifically, here's where you are now in our list. Fourth from the bottom. And you can look and, and see some of the kind of patterns. So within this chart, and it's just the countries we've studied, but the USA stands at the top. It has the most flexible exceptions environment by virtue of what we call a fair use right. A fair use right is a general open public interest exception to the copyright. And essentially it says, you may use any work by any user for any purpose as long as that use passes a fairness test 
And the key element of it is comparing the use itself, the interests of the user and of society, against any impact to the market of the work itself. So if you're doing an activity that causes no economic impact, then you pass the test very easily. Internet search. What does internet search do? Internet search makes a copy of everything on the internet. Everything on the internet is copyrighted. Copyright automatically tests the moment of expression. So to make a copy of everything on the internet, you need an exception. You don't currently have one. But fair use is one. And fair use will also encompass the next big technological revolution that we have that also uses copyright works in some ways that doesn't take away from the market of the author, but that we haven't thought of today. So problem number two. I mentioned that these markets tend to be dominated by monopolies and that we give them franchises to be the only particular server, to the only particular supplier of that book, for instance, whatever it is that's covered by copyright. And monopolies, monopolization causes particular problems in developing countries. So your economics textbook will tell you that what monopolists do is they raise prices and they reduce output, right? So we all know that. They'll sell less of the items, and they'll sell them at the higher price. And to some level, this is discussed as kind of the incentive of why we give intellectual property, to give you a little bit of market power. But that market power operates very differently depending on the shape of your market. So these are demand curves on the left side. And the demand curves for the United States versus the demand curve in South Africa. And they're based on income distribution. So those are deciles of income distribution. <coughs> so if everybody wanted pretty much the same thing, everybody wants to buy the textbook for your class that's required for the test, then you would expect that everybody has essentially the same willingness to pay and it's going to be the ability pay that sets the price in the market. Because remember, we're in a monopoly, so you can't undercut without violating the law. And notice what's different about the American demand curve and the South African demand curve looking at that first decimal. Right? And what's different is that the second decile in South Africa earns about 25% of the income as the first decile. So what does that mean? That means you would have to sell four times the number of units to make the same amount of money that you could just selling one at a higher price. And you're not going to do it because as you go down the demand curve, in order to pick up those people, you have to charge 25% of the price but you're only going to sell twice as many units. So it's unprofitable to lower your price and serve more of the market. So this is the profit maximizing. This is the revenue, right? So in the United States example, when you lower the price to pick up more volume, you make more money, and so you do. And when you lower the price to pick up more volume, you make more money, so you do. And you keep doing that until you get about 70% of the market. You still charge too much. But you're not charging as much as here, where at each point, every time you lower the price, you make less money, not more. And this is the economic logic of what you experience in fact. That when you hit a monopolized market, you experience global pricing. Why did AIDS drug suppliers charge $12,000 a year in South Africa in 1999? for drugs that we now know you can profitably make and sell for $82. Why? <clears throat> because you make more money serving 1% of the South African population than you do serving the whole thing. It's the logic of the system. And that's why breaking down that public-private and thinking of this as deeply influenced by our public commitments is super important. Right? Because we're creating these systems that have a logic that leads to what we call exclusionary pricing. Not just excessive, exclusionary. You will exclude most of your market from enjoying access to the 
it's not just drugs, right? So here's some non-essential copyrighted products that we did a little survey for. And you find not only is the price in South Africa expensive, because just charging the same price in South Africa as you do in the United States is exclusionary, right? The GDP per capita in South Africa is a tenth of the United States. So if you were going to serve a similar size of the population, just on average, you'd have to have at least a tenth of the price. But what you actually find is prices are often higher in South Africa than they are in wealthier countries. And we know this through, there's, there's examples that came out in the, in the Copyright Reform Commission of long walk to freedom costs about twice as much here as it does in the United States. It's not published in South Africa, it's published by a multinational the education market. So some quick just kind of facts and figures on what we're dealing with here. The ones that hit you the most, right? Textbook prices. So often some textbooks are written by South African authors and are published by small, small African publishers and the price may be relatively reasonable. But others, and I'm sure you have experiences and you should bring them up in the Q&A, is you're required to access the international textbook, right? And you may be paying 3,000 rand. And what, how are you supposed to pay three or 4,000 rand for a textbook? On average, people pay 6,000 rands for their entire, all of their textbooks for the full year in South Africa. And on average, bursaries are two or 3,000 know, for textbooks. So everybody's struggling in this area. So about a billion rand is spent on, on purchasing every year just by universities. This is figures by Denise Nicholson, who's here. The amount that's spent on licensing horse packs, which is where this really hits, is about 51 million of that. And of that, only about 15 million gets back to local purchasers. The rest is either going to the Collective Management Association itself or to foreign purchasers, right? Or foreign publishers. And out of that, of authors, of the purchasers, they get about 10% here, which is about half of what they're paid in most countries, and about zero of the licensing, because it's the publishers that have the licensing rights, not the authors. So very little, if any, of the money that comes from this 51 million goes to the authors, who are supposed to be the core And so, for instance, the University of Wisconsin, of UCT number, spends about 5 million a year on licensing and gets back to Bits Press about 250,000 a year. And so this opens up this kind of question. Like, is this what we want to do? So do we want to have really strong copyright rules on licensing so we make sure that we keep capturing and growing that market, most of which goes abroad and almost none of which goes to authors? Or would we like to convert this into savings and figure out different ways to spend that money that advances us all? more open access publishing, public, hiring uh, authors directly to publish books that could be released for free, etc. But this is this is the space that, that is being open now. And it's being opened because the law, and this is a, a quick rundown of some of the existing provisions, but probably most interesting to you is the education rights. The education rights in the bill says if this bill goes forward and passes into law, sitting on the president's desk now, course packs will no longer be licensed. You won't have to license, the university will not have to pay for excerpts that are included in course packs, which they do now. That's that 51 million rand. And lots of countries do this. It's a choice whether you want to include that into your law. And it also says, and this is kind of to some degree the radical and definitely controversial part, if you're a supplier, if you're a rights owner and you're not serving South Africa on reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, remember where that comes from? Quo Warranto, 13th century, right? Bringing those norms right back into the law. If you're not serving South Africa on reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, either because your book is out of print or because you're excessively pricing in the market, then for educational uses, you may copy the whole. So you'll probably see in a lot of the press, there's a lot of publishers are up in arms about this because it's definitely a topic. 
And I would argue it's an attack on the system in a way that really does embrace this idea of kind of depolarization. <coughs> that it takes the material aspects of what's going on in the publishing community very seriously. And it takes that quote from Robert Hale that I had in the beginning very seriously. That these prices are the product of our own rules. And therefore, we can change them. And so I think that's the context I want to leave you with on where we are in this specific copyright debate now. And turn it over to Ruth to even give you kind of a broader concept of where this comes from and how it ties in to larger narratives of decolonization. So Ruth, welcome. Welcome back to South Africa. We're so happy you came. And I'm going to turn it over to you. <clears throat> to be here in Cape Town and here at UCT in particular. Um, the Dean was very gracious in his introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually not here because of Dr. Order, who I know is Dr. Okoye actually, but her daughter is my goddaughter. And that's the only reason I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a great excuse to be back. But I'm also um, really delighted to be here talking about this process um, of copyright reform in South Africa. Um, I'm very passionate about copyright law, but I'm in particular passionate about what copyright law offers for advancing development, for ensuring the realization of fundamental human rights, um, and importantly, for giving the capacity to a country to achieve its own um, development 
priorities and objectives. Uh, because we are in a university, I'm going to be doing something slightly different. I want to make sure that um, students in the room in particular are um, um, both <coughs> able to ask questions, but also um, able to really dive deep into some of the theories and, and points that I'm going to be making. Um, and so I'm hoping that you'll have lots of questions. I'm going to shorten my lecture um, a little bit so that we make sure that we have enough room for um, questions. <clears throat> so many of you will be familiar with this map. This is, of course, the map of African colonies right after the Berlin Conference of 1884. And what this map does is give you a sense of how Africa was divided um, among the European powers um, of the day. Um, and the reason this map is important is not really to make us think about the past. I think that the idea of decolonization um, oftentimes orients us towards the past. And what I want to challenge all of South Africa today, and you in this room in particular, you students, um, is that the idea and the struggle for decolonization is about the future. It's about what your vision is for South Africa, what your vision is for your community, um, the ways in which you're going to empower yourselves as citizens, as members of a community, to accomplish and to achieve what your gifts and talents and the structural conditions in the country enable you to do. But the past is important because one of the things that matters is preparing for the future means you have to understand what shaped the past um, and the things that are good, bad, and ugly about that history. And if you look, of course, at this map, you will note that um, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, had significant influence in Africa. And this influence was um, really quite significantly reflected in um, copyright law and in all of intellectual property law. Now, when you think about copyright law, most people don't think, wow, this is what I want to get up in the morning and read about. Um, intellectual property in general is often buried. I, I like to describe to my own students that intellectual property, I want mean, you to think about them sometimes as the electricity lines. They, they, you know that electricity is on, that the power is on, you can see, um, but you don't see the wires. You don't see all of the technical details that go into the fabric of the building to, to, to make electricity and light possible. And intellectual property is like that. And I think that's part of why many don't see the connection between the nature of the legal regime for copyright and patent and trademark law and the socioeconomic rights and the structural conditions of the market that are so critical to development. And so in the United States, um, the uh, power to create and to design intellectual property law comes from the Constitution. And I want to make an argument to you today that I think that the same is true for South Africa. It's not framed as an intellectual property clause. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the um, US Constitution says to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Congress shall be empowered to do this, secure for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. We refer to this as the intellectual property clause. But I've highlighted the purpose of the clause to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. In other words, law as an institution and as a reflection of a society's values and norms and principles ought to be directed towards a central purpose. And that is the betterment of its citizens, the advancement of its society. And the South African Constitution, of course, contains quite remarkably a number of socioeconomic rights, freedom of expression, freedom of property, occupation, trade, etc. These are goals. And those goals and those objectives and those rights mean that there has to be a legal infrastructure that enables South African citizens to get to the place where the reality of expression is something that exists in, in a society where freedom of trade and of occupation and all of the other socioeconomic rights of housing, employment, etc., are able to be realized. And so in on which all of intellectual property jurisprudence in the US rests is not materially different from what you see in the socioeconomic rights and the South African Bill of Rights in 
the South African <laughs> framework. But it's not just in constitutions. The World Trade Organization's agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights has this in its preamble. South Africa is a member of the WTO. Um, this is embedded in the international trade system. That why are we engaged in a global effort to protect intellectual property rights, copyrights and patents and trademarks? Why? Because there's an underlying of the policy that the protection of copyright law, the protection of patent law, even trademark law that does something very different, has a national objective. It includes development. And in order to achieve that national objective, then to have maximum flexibility. This is the preamble, what we would call really the constitution of the TRIPS agreement the foremost international agreement for the protection of copyright and patent and trademark law and other forms of intellectual property. These are the values. These are the uh, priorities. These are the modalities that countries gathered around to say, uh, this is why we are here. Now, nobody pays a lot of legal attention to the preamble, but these are not just words that exist for nothing. Now, within the TRIPS itself, Article 7 talks about the objectives of the protection of intellectual property. And for those of you who've had a national trade or have taken classes from um, the faculty members here, um, you will note, of course, that one of the things that is happening um, is that intellectual property is now fundamentally a part of international trade, a part of the international economic order. And so countries are mandated to protect intellectual property, and they're mandated to recognize the minimum rights that these treaties demand in national law. But even with that, the construction of legal frameworks for the protection of copyright and other forms of intellectual property is to the mutual advantage of producers and users of technological knowledge in a manner that is conducive to social and economic welfare and to a balance of rights and obligations. <clears throat> now, despite what the Constitution says and despite what the TRIPS agreement says, and we'll see shortly, despite what human rights treaties say, the reality is that every development indicator today reflects most poorly in precisely the areas where copyright law and patent law are supposed to be doing the most work. Whenever you are asking, well, what is copyright law doing for South Africa? What is it doing for other countries on the African continent? Where is this socioeconomic growth? Where's the freedom of expression? Where's the exchange of ideas that the legal system is supposed to produce? In all of the markers that we see, and certainly on the continent, including in South Africa, we are not seeing, and, and, and Sean references a little bit, the similar advancement and growth of domestic markets, of domestic entrepreneurship, of local innovation. And yet, intellectual property has been on this continent since the colonial era. And in fact, I remember my first visit to South Africa and, and looking at the IP statutes, and, and some, of the, the, some of the statutes still had the British emblem on them. And of course, as part of the colonial architecture, legal systems were very much central to the capacity of colonial administrators to carry out the wishes of the crown. And so I think it's not too surprising today that what copyright and patents and trademarks ought to be doing today is not reflected <clears throat> in the economic and social reality, and some would even say political reality, of South Africa, and not only of South Africa, but many other countries. You're all familiar with the human rights regime, and I'm not going to take time, but I wanted to, to again reemphasize that there's this gap between 
what we see on paper and what foreign investors or international organizations would say is the logic and the reasons for intellectual property um, and the reality on the ground in many African countries. And I was struck by that today because on my flight from Johannesburg, a wonderful air hostess said, would you like a paper? And I thought, well, I've got two hours. I should read something other than law. <laughs> and so I asked for the paper, and, and, and um, the kind person next to me said, well, you don't really want the business day. Now, by the way, uh, you're recording. This might be a copyright infringement under South Africa. So the kind, I will be going back to the stage where this is for you, so I'm not going to have a problem. So the kind of gentleman next to me said, well, you know, you don't really want to read the business day. It's all about, you know, business. It's not really interesting. Do you want to read the, I think it was the mail or something? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's fine. I'll just, you know, if I, I, I need to sleep. And so, you know, reading something businessy will put me to sleep. <laughs> and instead of putting me to sleep, I had, um, no, I didn't have the best time. I broke out in sweat. <laughs> because on the first page is an article that, uh, actually the picture of police in Johannesburg, and it says that um, the headline was counterfeit goods. Almost a yeah. week after central Johannesburg erupted into chaos, police came under attack. They were conducting raids and confiscating counterfeit yeah. goods. The police stepped up pressure on Wednesday, but shop owners, shop owners resisted and attacked the police officers damaging their vehicles. And then it occurred to me, this is an IP issue right on the front page of the business paper. And it occurred to me that local entrepreneurs in Johannesburg, and I'm assuming that these sorts of complications are happening all over South Africa, that local businesses are investing in the purchase and the sale of counterfeit goods. And the question is why? Why are the goods not being produced cheaply enough? Why are they not accessible enough to the average South African? Why resort to the purchase and distribution of counterfeit goods? <clears throat> and so I'm thinking about this because I'm thinking about the average income of the average South African. And you can take this problem and translate it anywhere on this continent. How much do people earn that gives them access to goods and services that are wrapped in intellectual property. And then, of course, I got to the end of the paper, and there's this amazing article about the tech-enabled future will create jobs for the unskilled and the reskilled. And right on the um, paper, is a little picture that talks about online training. And you read the article, and it's an amazing article. You read the article, and it's, it talks about the future for South Africa that's amazing. And reskilling and retraining South Africans and, and, and applying new knowledge and new content to the ICT um, <clears throat> boom that the world is experiencing. And then I said, but you don't have fair use. How are you going to train? Are you going to buy all the content for this re-education? Hmm. I heard from students yesterday that many of them could not afford their textbooks, and I thought to myself, this is a great vision. But the legal infrastructure to facilitate this vision actually doesn't currently exist. And so the question about decolonization is not just about erasing the past. It's asking the question, what kinds of changes are necessary to make that vision a reality, and what kinds of changes are necessary to enable local innovators and entrepreneurs and manufacturers to have good reasons not to resort to counterfeit. The right to development requires something very different from the IP laws that I see across the continent. And it requires, frankly, something very different even from the IP laws that I see in developed countries because the global knowledge economy requires a greater flexibility for citizens to engage productively in the creation and in the dissemination of knowledge. Base. 
Joseph Stiglitz, uh, the Nobel laureate, um, I think put it really quite well when he says really what separates industrialized countries from non-industrialized countries is a knowledge gap. It's a knowledge gap that is linked to inappropriately designed intellectual property systems. It's not the cause of all of the ills of underdevelopment, but in a global knowledge economy, how you design access to knowledge becomes a fundamental criteria for any effort to advance economic growth. Given the status quo as it exists today, there is no data in the design of IP laws as we know it today showing a significant relationship between access to medicines and domestic research and development. In other words, the law that you have today and the laws that have brought South Africa this far and other countries this far in the global south are not related to the intellectual property statutes that are on the books today. And so if there was an access to medicines problem, and there still is, by the way, around certain uh, essential medicines, if there was an access to medicines problem that was robbing South Africa of the lives of millions of citizens years ago, that problem is still bubbling under the surface. And that problem is not just a problem about access to, to medicine so that people can live. It's also about access to knowledge so that people can thrive. It makes no sense, as I've said repeatedly to my students and policymakers around the world, to save human lives and then watch them shrivel because they cannot access fundamental goods necessary for their own self-actualization. And it's for that reason that early American copyright law basically said, we're going to focus on domestic <laughs> authors. We're going to reserve to citizens the right to copy foreign works, because what we need to do is to create a literate economy. We need to create a literate population. And so the United States, as a young, newly independent, developing country secured within its copyright law low-cost access to European literature because leaders said this is essential. It's essential for development. And that means, of course, that what every country ought to be looking at is locally relevant creativity, locally relevant innovation, because if existing models of intellectual property law have not delivered on the development promise, then it suggests that the design of those legal frameworks needs to be different. And where is the responsibility for that redesign? What in South Africa is being defined as decolonization. Where is that responsibility? Because within the international intellectual property framework, what states have to do is provide the incentives to create. But the responsibility for the balance that we saw in the TRIPS preamble, the balance that the South African Constitution requires, the balance that the World Trade Organization um, of, of Article 7 of TRIPS requires, that responsibility of balancing rights and limitations and exceptions lies with the state lies with the government. States were historically in the IP framework and today responsible for working out the balance between rights and limitations in the public interest. And for South Africa, if this investment that the country is making in digital technologies, and, and I saw that there are digital hubs uh, to, to train people springing up. If that's going to happen, it's got to happen because South Africa is investing in human capital formation. The reason I care about copyright, frankly, is not because I love movies. I mean, no offense to any movie makers here. <laughs> the reason I love copyright is because I love education. 
Because access to education is what transforms a person's capacity to advance and to experience self-actualization. And as my good friend and leading copyright scholar in the US, Professor Je Jessica Littman describes it, we don't have copyright law because we just want to create a warehouse of books. The most important reason we want authors to create, the reason we give authors rights, is because we want people to read those books. We want people to listen to that music. We want them to see the art, to watch the films. That is what we call progress, or in the words of the international framework, what we call development. So what's happening? What's happening is technology is disrupting the current framework for copyright protection and in fact for all of IP protection. And the challenge for Africa in particular is that every disruption overseas affects African development in very different ways. And, and whether this digital technological shift that we're seeing is going to impact positively in South Africa and around the continent will depend on the institutional frameworks both business and legal. And that's where your copyright reform really comes in. Now, fundamentally, everyone is clear that copyright is a tax. It's a tax on readers in order to incentivize authorship. And this is something that has been recognized since the beginning of the, copyright, the modern copyright system um, in England. This is a quote from the famous uh, speech by Macaulay in 1841 to the English House of Commons. We, we, we need copyright law. We need rights to authors and to creators and to inventors. That is not a question. But it must be understood as a tax. If there was a better way to do it, we still need to find that better way. But for now, it's a tax. Because the <coughs> economics of producing works requires that there be a reward to those who produce them. But copyright law is more than just the production of works, as I've just said. You want people to read those works. You want people to watch the movies, to, to listen to the music, because that's how you create and cultivate productive citizens. So, so why does copyright law matter? Well, copyright law undergirds so much. It matters because it gives access to textbooks. It matters because it promotes education and literacy. It strengthens human capital. It increases <coughs> economic development. It matters because it regulates the information economy. That's why copyright law matters. And the problem is that in the old regime, with the disconnect between development and copyright law, we didn't focus on access. We didn't focus on dissemination. How do students get books to prepare for class? How, how do ordinary students in kindergarten and elementary school afford books if their parents don't have jobs? How, how do we produce the kind of literate population that can vote intelligently and contribute to their country's civic and economic and social development? Jessica Lindman again says recently that a copyright law cannot properly encourage authors to create if it imposes undue burdens on readers. Because every author is a reader. And many readers eventually become authors. And of course, Judge Pierre Laval, one of the leading judges um, in, in the US in, in um, the Second Circuit in the New York District, um, has this point in a famous case about fair use, that copyright is not inevitable, it's not divine, it's not a natural right. It is designed to stimulate progress in the arts. And this is a case about fair use, and it talks about how fair use helps to do that. But what I want to point out is that defining Copyright necessarily means you're defining the limits in order to accomplish the purposes for which it exists. Now, I'm going to not spend too much time as much as I love teaching about copyright law, but for the students, I thought it was really important. I know uh, Professor Nkube and Professor Sonwater probably goes through this in their copyright classes, so I'm not going to 
spend too much time, but I, I thought it was important for those of you non-lawyers to get a sense of copyright theory because the theory informs how you do your reform. What are you trying to accomplish in South Africa? And one of the key issues, of course, is that no copyright law fails any one of these theories. Every copyright regime has to have glimpses of fairness, of personality, of welfare, and <clears throat> cultural theory because of what copyright does, um, and in particular in a knowledge economy. So how do we, how do we move to decolonization? in South Africa. And I think um, if you hear nothing else that I've said today, it's important to hear this, that in my view, the goal of copyright law in South Africa, and frankly in many African countries, moving away from the colonial legacy is to move from exclusion to inclusion. That means inclusion of the interests of users, inclusion of the socioeconomic objectives that are critical for South Africa's development, inclusion of limits and exceptions to rights that make it possible for libraries and other intermediaries to facilitate the dissemination of knowledge. Why? Because one of the things that colonial copyright law did was to exclude locals from the knowledge ecosystem. The famous Laval Decree, um, I mentioned yesterday, and it's always, I think, a shock to people to know that many, during the colonial period, many non-Europeans were not allowed to obtain copyright over their works. In fact, during the colonial era, many filmmakers were forbidden from making films because the colonial administrators thought that films were, quote, too complex for Africans to produce or to understand. And in fact, when during the colonial period locals wrote books or tracts, they were not allowed to protect them under copyright law and they were sometimes prohibited if they were critical of the colonial state. And so it was a legacy of exclusion where individuals who were not viewed as citizens, as full citizens, <clears throat> could not participate or had the terms of their participation in the economy and in the culture and the society circumscribed by copyright law. And of course, it was a legacy of barriers to knowledge accumulation because you don't get to be an author just by going to kindergarten. It actually requires a bit more schooling. <laughs> In Southern Africa, where locals could not access even works that were written in Britain. And of course, it was racialized. And it was racialized because the history of technology is a racial history, because European intellectual enlightenment viewed technological progress as synonymous with racial superiority. And so there was a fundamental view that uncivilized people, typically black people, people of color across the Americas and Asias, um, were not really capable of, of accumulating knowledge, were not capable of actually becoming authors and writers and, and filmmakers. And it was clear, as early as Gibbons pathbreaking work, it was clear that even then, countries would be differentiated by their capacity to accumulate knowledge. And you see that actually in, in, in a really, I, I, in fact, I, I was working many years ago and I saw this, uh, this quote and I just chuckled, where the hierarchy of who gets to access knowledge and who can create knowledge was very clearly set out. And then intellectual property laws facilitated that by deciding who got to participate and who did not. And so African creativity and creativity by Africans, for Africans, in Africa could not flourish under colonial copyright laws. There were substantive barriers, there were procedural barriers. And if you think about the features of colonial copyright law, 
These are the features you want to avoid in your current debate about copyright reform in, in, in South Africa. There was an asymmetry of information. There, there, there was a benefit to foreigners as opposed to locals. There was a requirement of treating everyone equally in a formal way, but the result of that formal equality was that the most vulnerable, the poorest people, people who couldn't afford education, were the ones who suffered the most. And of course, it was typically centralized uh, control. In other words, the interests of outsiders governed. Um, and I think in this context of a copyright reform, Professor Fumi Ariwa has been working on a, on a book called Disrupting Africa, looking at the role of technology in African development. And she points out, of course, that institutional frameworks, legal frameworks in particular, are still influenced by those features of colonial copyright law. And not only colonial copyright law, but frankly also colonial business laws. And that's got to change. It's got to change because when you look at the Berne Convention, the Berne Convention <coughs> of the International Copyright Framework doesn't give you what you need to get to a copyright law in South Africa that is inclusive, that protects local innovators and entrepreneurs, that makes possible the retooling of millions of South Africans to prepare them for the digital economy. What it does is it gives rights but it gives no limitations and exceptions. And where it does, it gives them fairly minimally. And so for example, there is no mandatory, the reason there's a debate in South Africa about fair use and all of the different features of the, of the Copyright Reform Act um, in South Africa is because the international system left it to the state to take care of the socioeconomic interests of the state. <clears throat> there is no international mandatory fair use doctrine. There's no international public domain. There are no real international protections for traditional knowledge. All of the things that make copyright an instrument and an engine of free expression and of social economic cultural development don't exist at the international level. And so domestic legislation can always go above that and should based on what development priorities are. And so if you understand that these laws are not culturally neutral. They're not scientifically designed or derived. You have to understand that making copyright law work for local innovators and creators requires the state to take action. And so in my view, decolonizing intellectual property law is fundamentally about reorienting the state's power reorienting that power away from foreign interests and predominantly thinking about how is the system going to work within the South African context. Now, it matters because in the digital environment, copyright law has to do these things. It must protect creators. It must encourage amateur creativity. It must keep pace with technology. And that means it's got to be flexible. It's going to be flexible. And in a country that has the kind of constitutional protections as South Africa does, it baffles me that there is a debate about adopting a flexible limitation and exception. How do you draw the balance between freedom of expression and hate speech? How, how do you draw the balance between the right uh, to own property and the need for people to get to a river and have easements? Everything in South Africa's history, more than any other country in Africa, is about balance. And to think that a law that requires balancing when competition or when local innovation is at stake is implausible strikes me as a repetition of what we saw in the colonial copyright regime. A copyright law needs to protect and capitalize on digital education tools. And in fact, the international <coughs> system anticipated that this was going to happen. It anticipated that the need for flexibility was going to be necessary in every state. Why? Because technological advancement means you don't know 
what is possible today. When I was growing up, the word Facebook didn't even exist. Twitter, to me, was what birds did in the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, Instagram, I, you know, what is that? Now, how many people have been on Facebook today? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, <coughs> 70, 80% of the room. How many people have been on email and forwarded something today on WhatsApp, email, or anything else today? All right, almost 100% of the room. So you are all infringers under South African copyright law. What is your defense? <laughs> you all need very good lawyers. Now let me also say that part of the challenge, I think, of what's happening with the reform bill is that it's also too backward looking. In the absence of a flexible system, you're not going to be prepared for a digital economy that is governed by big data, that is generating copyrighted works by artificial intelligence. I mean, there will be a day when AI can produce textbooks. And when AI is generating textbooks for science and math and law, this debate <coughs> is going to happen again in the absence of an open-ended, flexible standard that allows courts and policymakers to say, do we want to give protection to a machine? Ultimately, a copyright system that lacks the fundamental balancing tools necessary for cultural production and engagement by ordinary citizens will not position countries for global competitiveness. Because every major firm today is a firm that has emerged, gotten big, and overweight, <clears throat> and global because it has had access to knowledge. A lot of times it's your knowledge and it's mine. Your data and mine. <coughs> because when you look at who owns that data, well, copyright law actually gives thin protection to data. But ultimately, the data that is fueling global firms today <coughs> is data that is obtained, why? Because you're on Facebook, because you're on a platform. And so ultimately, you want to make sure that the new copyright dawn of South Africa looks nothing like the old one. The right to create, the right to earn, the right to be a reader as well as an author. And so for South Africa, the new law needs to do these things. It needs to address these things and is to ensure that the consequences of the colonial framework are avoided in the new regime. You don't have to call something colonial for it to be colonial. What you have to do is look at what the law does, who it impacts, who it enables, how it facilitates the priorities that are set forth in the broader general law. Just because Sean has done this already, I think it's important to note why the US was number one on that slide. It's precisely because mm -hmm. of the value that is added when my students are reading a textbook that I've written, and at the end of the semester, they send me four page notes about all the things that I should change, and they send me highlights. They're able to do that because they know that they have an open ended system that facilitates their engagement with cultural products already existing. And so copyright law must facilitate the production of knowledge. It must facilitate access to information. It must assist in the formation of human capital and absorptive capacity. This is required not because copyright law exists for one side and not another, but it is required because copyright law is a fundamental building block for the development of citizens who not only are literate and have access to education, but also citizens who are able to contribute meaningfully not only to a national economy, but to a global economy. I said yesterday that this copyright bill is not just for South Africa. It's for the world. Because the next Bill Gates or Zuckerberg or whoever else may be sitting in this room, 
may be sitting out in the townships. Wherever there is a South African citizen, there should never be a question about whether that citizen is able to read, to reproduce, to share, and to disseminate their own unique way of consuming cultural goods. Because only in that kind of setting are you going to get the innovation and the entrepreneurship that fuels the kind of development goals that are enshrined in the South African Constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.